Hi, uh, my name is Kiran Patil and I have joined with my colleagues Amrita Nambiar and Sridhar Samudrala. Today, we will be talking about application device queues for system level network IO performance improvement. Okay, so as we go along, the agenda is going to be uh, what is the motivation of talking about this? Uh, what are all the system inefficiencies to solve the SAID problem? In the brief introduction about what is ADQ, uh, the ingredients, uh, kind of putting it all together, and we will move on to the performance section and uh, look at the high level of the benefits of ADQ and translate it back to how the system inefficiencies are addressed and kind of what is the next step? Where do we go from here? And then at the end, there will be references and we'll be open up for the question and answer. Okay, so <clears throat> talking about the motivation and the speeding up the networking, why does it matter? Basically in the uh, Linux conference uh, 2006, there was a Linux, uh, there was this paper presented by Jan Wakobson and the team. And it talked about how the end of the wire isn't the end of the net. So if you look at it, the picture on the left, it talks about uh, basically what they did before that one, they did a small experiment on the uniprocessor system as well as on the multiprocessor system. The experiment was about running the net per test and seeing that do they get the same benefit or does the per, uh, benefit or the performance improves when they go from uniprocessor to multiprocessor. Actually, the result were opposite. On uniprocessor system, the performance was say X and on the multiprocessor system, it got degraded. So then uh, he talked, uh, then there was a dis discussion about the model where, uh, you know, typically you have a network device, it uh, generates the interrupt, uh, then there is a ISR runs, then uh, it, uh, it triggers the software interrupt, and then in between there is a protocol processing. So this is basically the interrupt level work, and then there is a task level work where the application talks the socket. This is the model we know of, it became the standard. But the idea of this one saying that, hey, if you want really the performance in the multiprocessor system, we need to think differently. What we have done one way is not necessarily always the same way to do it. So what, what the gist of that one is to say that uh, you want to have a model where uh, most of the work is done at the sockets, at the application and driven from the application and do a minimal work inside the net. So basically let the socket do everything and do the uh, as less work possible uh, inside the net. And here, the, when we talk about the net, it comprises of the several element, which is your, the network device, then the OS software and whatnot until it hits the socket. Now, how does this translate to internet stability? So there is a picture on the right hand side. It shows, think like a network connection is like a loop, sender, receiver. So in the back in the old days when there was no kernel and there was no protocol based implementation, it was like a simple loop and there was a strong feedback mechanism both way. So the receiving application and the sender application kind of knows each other's dynamics and they are reflected on the wire. And this model had worked correctly. But as the system evolved where we moved to the kernel based protocol implementation, now suddenly it became from one loop to two loop. Now, uh, as we know the general, uh, uh, theorem as per the, the basically uh, Raj, uh, Ruth and Horvitz saying that, hey, when you have two couple loops, they will be always less stable than one. Great. Now, how do we apply this to the networking? So the, when you apply this to the networking, what it means is when you have the kernel based protocol implementation, it essentially hides the receiving app dynamics from the center which essentially complicates the RTT estimate and causes the spurious retransmission and all the fun begins. So basically uh, to do the uh, everything from the application, we still need to come up with a model where it acts like one big giant loop. Basically no intermediate entity kind of hides the detail from each other. So, so that's really the uh, point of that saying the internet stability is important and how do we really solve that even in the modern system? when you have um, systems with hundreds of CPUs and faster and faster devices, high speed devices with lots of queues and whatnot. Okay. Moving on to next one, the, the idea is let the application do everything, uh, basically let the socket do everything and do inside then uh, do minimum work inside the net. Uh, but to do that in a modern system, uh, 
there are some uh, several inefficiencies exist and we need to look at each of those inefficiencies and essentially see how we can address those, in, those inefficiencies. Now, the uh, first and the foremost important which affects the performance is the interrupt. So when we talk about interrupt, what it means when the application is doing some useful work, if the device generates an interrupt and interrupt being the high priority, it gets service. What it means that the application which is doing the useful work is getting context switch out and the interrupt takes a priority, it executes. And as a result of the application which is processing say some requests and trying to send some response, the response doesn't get sent right away. It, uh, it adds the jitter. The second uh, important point about the performance is the uh, context switches and the synchronization. So those two things typically you see they show up more and more in the multiprocessor system because they occur due to the sharing happens in the networking stack. So idea there is how do you minimize the context switches? How do you minimize or eliminate the synchronization needs such as locks? And as we know, locks basically uh, affects the performance in a negative way. So the second point is how do we address and minimize the synchronization needs? The third, the third system uh, basically inefficiencies come about working set locality. How do you uh, contain uh, or address the working set locality issue? Means how do you make sure your application and the protocol processing uh, operate in the same context? And that also will result into reducing the data moment. Uh, so basically the data moment during the packet processing for control and data. We want to minimize that if you want to contain, contain the working set locality. So the idea of this one is uh, that last mile, which is the end of the wire is not end of the net. Essentially the end of the wire is the end of the app. To make that happen, we really need to look at the system inefficiencies and how do you address those. So last year, Intel announced a technology called ADQ, application device queues. It is primarily a workload optimization technology aimed at package steering and queuing. And um, basically, <clears throat> we will see that uh, how this technology is uh, trying to solve the system inefficiencies and whatnot. So before we go and uh, dive into the details, how the technology, I would like to give, give the brief overview about ADQ. Now, what is really the ADQ? So at its heart, it is queuing and steering technology. By the way, it is not a protocol. It is a queuing and steering technology built on the top of the existing rich history of the queuing and technology exist in the Linux stack, in the Linux kernel networking stack. But with the slight twist, and the slight twist is by bringing the application in the picture and putting it at the forefront, uh, forefront of the decision making. Decision making about the packet queuing, the packet steering, which is done on its behalf. So you are essentially putting the application at the front and it is becoming responsible or becoming the driving factor for such decision making. The, what you can also do with the, uh, now you can see the pic picture on the left hand side, it shows you have a network device and on the right side you have application and each application is uh, color coded differently. Uh, so what it gives, it gives a dedicated and isolated queues, uh, dedicated and isolated queues per application. So with that, one can create an express, dedicated express lane between the application thread of execution to the hardware queues. And, uh, <clears throat> so in addition to that, uh, what one can do with the ADQ is about the egress, egress bandwidth. Basically when you have a device, say 100 gig device, and you're running multiple application, uh, if you don't do anything, it's like a first come first served basis. You may have a situation where some application may not get bandwidth or may get uh, less bandwidth, whereas they need more. So ADQ provides a standard mechanism where uh, in application specific manner, you can prioritize and divide that bandwidth among the multiple applications. As the, all, all this one is done using the uh, standard in kernel networking framework, uh, which has been made, uh, basically the, there has been substantial changes made to that and the contribution is done to the back in the open source community. And you will see that as we go along. The, uh, from the slide perspective, the third point is uh, well, from application, there is a small change is desired. The small change is desired to create the single producer consumer model between the application thread to this hardware queues. As you can see those green light from the each application or from NVMU or TCP application going to uh, uh, basically having this dedicated lane with the 
uh, hardware queues, likewise uh, the yellow and the blue and whatnot. So essentially to create this single producer consumer model, the small application change is desired so that the application thread of execution is aligned with those hardware queues. And in general, the core design principle of the application is uh, because application is aware of its action, application best know its need. So let it let application be the deciding factor or at least have a say in the packet queuing, packet sharing and the packet processing, which is done on, on its behalf. And as you will see that once we have the single producer consumer and uh, dedicated and isolated queues, how some of this uh, system inefficiencies gets addressed uh, one by one. So uh, now I'll I will hand it over to the Amrita, which will walk you through the uh, ADQ ingredients. Yeah, so as Kiran just explained, what ADQ provides is applications can have their own customizable range of queues. And these queues can be dedicated for the application. So let's now look into the details of how we can make this practical. Uh, the first step here is configuring the application priority. So uh, a network priority needs to be associated with all traffic originating from the application. In Linux, we have various mechanisms to do this. So firstly, we have the C group uh, and C group V1 has a controller called NetPrio. We could use the NetPrio controller to set priority for applications belonging to a certain C group. Now, since C group is moving on to a newer version called C group V2, uh, which is going to be uh, adopted by uh, distros and containers, C group V2 has deprecated the NetPrio controller. So here we are using the BPF approach. Uh, we use the C group SOC op type of BPF program to set the socket priority for the application. And lastly, we also have the option of modifying the application itself uh, using the SO priority socket option to set the application priority. Now, once the priority is set, we have the second step, which is configuring the queue set or the queue group itself. Here we use the standard Linux TC subsystem, the MQ prior scheduler to be specific. Uh, so Linux has a multi-queue priority scheduler and the multi-queue priority scheduler already had support for creating traffic classes and mapping the application priority to a traffic class. So we essentially leveraged this mechanism and we also extended the MQ prior scheduler. We added shaping features to the MQ prior scheduler wherein we could uh, configure minimum and maximum bandwidth rates for each of the traffic classes. So this would ensure a guaranteed bandwidth rate uh, for every application and avoid any resource starving. And uh, we also introduced a new offload mode in MQ prior. So MQ Prio has a default hardware offload mode. It's called DCB, wherein the number of PCs could be offloaded to the device. So in the new offload mode that we introduced, it's called the channel mode. We could offload the number of PCs, the priority to PC mapping, uh, the queue layout or the queue configuration itself, and the bandwidth rates per traffic class to the device. And we also extended the user space counterpart, the IP route to uh, for each of the additional functionalities we added for MQ prior. So here's an example of how we configure this. Uh, so using the MQ prior queuing discipline, we create four TCs and we can also see the map where the priorities are mapped to the TCs. So we have priority zero mapped to TC zero, priority one to TC one and likewise. Then in the next line, we have the queue layout. So this is the queue distribution per traffic class. Uh, we specify the uh, base queue and the number of queues for each of the traffic class. And in the next line, we have the minimum rates configured for each of the traffic class. And in the last line, we have the max rates specified for each of the traffic class. So this finishes up the uh, queue group configuration for the applications.
Now let's move on to the next slide. So once the queue groups are configured, uh, we need to isolate the incoming traffic into each of these queue groups. For this, we use the TC flower classifier in Linux. We extended TC flower uh, to direct incoming traffic to the queue group or the queue set that we created using MQ prior. And we could also offload this filter into the hardware. So on the right hand side, I have some examples of how to add this filter and offload it to the device. So we use some application identifier. Uh, here we are using the destination IP and the destination port. And based on the application identifier, we direct the incoming traffic to a certain traffic class or queue group created using MQ prior. And in TC flower, we use the hardware TC option to specify the traffic class. And finally, we need to select the queue within the queue group. For this, we use some hardware mechanism like RSS or flow director for the queue selection. So now we have seen the queue group configuration, the isolation into the queue group and the queue selection itself. Let's move on to the next slide. So uh, to set up rest of the ADQ ingredients, we had to extend and move beyond the TC subsystem itself. We worked in other networking subsystems in Linux. Uh, in ADQ, the core idea is that uh, we try to maintain a synchron synchronization free single producer consumer model. To accomplish this, we try to establish a unique pipe between the application thread and the device queue. For this, we follow a two-fold approach. So firstly, we align the application thread to the receive side and then to the transmit side. So let's see how we uh, can do the receive side alignment. So we worked in the busy polling subsystem. So busy poll already had support for standard system calls like receive and poll. We then extended the ePoll subsystem. Uh, so we added BusyPoll support to ePoll sockets. So with this ePoll enablement, what the application gets is application threads can have multiple sockets which get traffic from the same receive queue. And when applications call ePoll wait and there are no events available to report, then BusyPoll can pull packets from this receive queue. So here's an example of how we use this control to specify the busy poll configuration. The value is the time in microseconds to wait until a package arrives on the receive queue for polling. We'll now look into the queue identification aspect of this. Uh, for this, we use the NAPI ID as a unique metadata to identify the queue. The NAPI ID is associated with a queue vector. So we introduced a new socket option called the SO incoming NAPI ID. Applications can uh, query the NAPI ID and then split the incoming traffic across the threads depending on the queue the packet arrived on. So with this, we complete the application thread alignment to the receive queue. Uh, we'll now move on to the next slide where we can see how uh, the application threads get aligned to the transmit side or the transmit queue. So here we work with the XPS mechanism. So Linux XPS uh, or transmit packet steering is based on sender CPU. We extended this to support uh, receive queue based transmit packet, transmit queue selection. So receive queue or receive queue map is provided as a hint to select the transmit queue. Uh, and this can be done by writing the queue mask for each of the transmit queues to the sysfs attribute, which is uh, called R XPS RX queues. So this is an optional configuration using the sysfs interface. And uh, uh, the fallback mechanism is the already supported XPS using sender CPUs or the jhash based algorithm. Now the idea behind doing this uh, is to align the transmit and receive queues. So with this, we can have egress and ingress traffic traversing on a symmetric uh, transmit and receive queue pair. 
So what we get out of this is that transmit completions can be locked to the same queue association that application is polling on. So this avoids the overhead of having to trigger an interrupt on a different CPU. And when the application is busy polling the uh, packets from the receive queue and processing it in the application thread context, the transmit completions can also happen along with it in the same thread context. So this avoids any latency as well. So this completes the application thread alignment to the transmit queue. So in the next slide, we'll see various Linux versions where each of the ADQ ingredients got upstreamed into the Linux kernel. So with 419, we complete uh, upstreaming the various ADQ ingredients. And now I'll hand over back to Kiran for rest of the session. Thank you, Amrita. Uh as we saw the overview of the various in ingredients. Uh, now the last, last part of the puzzle is the align application thread to a queue. So this is what we also refer as a change in the application. So there are class of application where you do not need to change anything uh, such as single threaded application or the application who do not wish to uh, perform any busy polling or if there are application where they are using the standard Linux way to do the distribution of connections to the worker queue, uh, to the worker thread, uh, where if they decide to use SO reuse port, then the kernel based load balancing system just works fine. The small BPF program can be attached and it can do a job. Uh, so there, but there is a one class of application like memcache, which it employs its own load distribution technique uh, because it's a server application. So it has, uh, in, in their case, they have one thread uh, doing all the accepts connection and dispatching the connection to the different worker thread to essentially handle those connections. So that logic needs a small modification uh, uh, where it will use the SO incoming API ID as a socket option and based on the return value, it will decide and pick the worker thread. Uh, so this change is only needed if you want optimal performance. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, this change will allow essentially to get to the single producer consumer all the way from the application thread of execution to the hardware queues. But I have, as I have explained, there are other ways to do it for some other application. One can use just the sideband filter if it is just single threaded application or a, a other means. But there are certain class of application where you need to make small changes uh, with respect to how the basically the connections are handled and dispatch. Okay. Now uh, we saw the various ingredients and uh, uh, Basically, how do you align your application thread to the hardware queues to get to the single producer consumer? Now we will look at some of the performance aspect. Uh, so using all this one, we put uh, this memcache uh, application to the test. So what you see on the right hand side is the device under test, which is the next generation, Intel's next generation NIC, uh, which is hosting the memcache server. And on the left hand side, the standard client, it's a 10 clients, uh, environment and uh, with memcache it is like a request response you send a key and saying that uh, i want a basically response it's like a key value pair okay so that's really the test topology now let's look at the some of the performance result so when you talk about uh, the application like memcache essentially they look the uh, three or four factor one of them is obviously a throughput as you can see uh, on the y-axis is your throughput, on the x-axis axis is your total number of connections. The light blue bar is when you don't have ADQ, basically ADQ off. And the dark blue vertical bar is, it, it represents the ADQ on. And as you can see, irrespective of the number of connections, right, say around from 300 connections to 4,400 connections, there is a healthy increase when you have the ADQ turn on with respect to the throughput. So more or less 70 or greater than 70% throughput improvement all the way to the end, means it is scaling with respect to even the number of connections. So uh, obviously when you talk throughput, higher is better. The second important factor, basically uh, uh, for this application, which they look for is the latency. Now latency has uh, you know, various factor uh, or the various point. One is the average latency. So again, there here, the lower is better. So you can see a dark blue bar is lower. Uh, 
uh, across all the connections and there is reduction of the average latency approximately 60 percent or so and it scales well even with them as the number of connections are increasing when you have the adq turned on so that that is a, a second important factor when we talk about the performance the third one is the predictability okay now uh, the predictability is probably the, the most important factor for this application they are looking for. Predictability is measured by 99.9% uh, .9 latency. So there also you can see across the all number of connections from 200 uh, to 4400, there is a reduction in the latency at 99% uh, percentile and the reduction is almost like 60 percent and this reduction directly translates to the predictability so this is a 60 percent predictability increase when you have adq turned on for a given application compared to the baseline now putting this all together i know this one uh, one, one graph is probably overcrowded but the idea of this one is it shows throughput as well as it shows the latency and the x-axis is your total number of connections. So that uh, red line, it talks, it's about SLA, service level agreement. So as you can see, when you have the ADQ is turned off, that red box which says ADQ off exceeds one millisecond. So when you when the ADQ is off, the SLA is exceeded at eight million tr uh, transactions per second. It means after that one, your service level agreement is not met. I mean, some requests are taking more than one millisecond. Whereas what you see is, even with ADQ, as the throughput is increasing, going from 8 million all the way to 19 million here, the service level agreement is still made, means the latency is still less than one millisecond. As you can see that uh, uh, dark uh, line, which is just uh, below the red line about SLA, that is basically the latency number with uh, ADQ. And you can see them, they are well below the SLA. So here with the ADQ on, it's more or less 100, uh, whatever the throughput improvement is 140% compared to 8 million to 19 million while meeting the SLA as measured by 99.9% uh, percentile when the ADQ is turned on. Now at high level, the, the benefits of the ADQ is, yes, it improves the throughput, that's great. It reduces the latency, that's great. But more than that, it increases the predictability by providing consistent reduction in the latency uh, and it is scaling all the way to even the higher number of connections. Moving on to next slide. So we saw those were a lot of ingredients and in the first few slides we talk about hey how do we let uh, let application do everything basically let socket do everything and now we have this two two loops where you have the kernel based protocol implementation and we identified some of the system inefficiencies uh, which uh, which was hindering to get to that uh, goal of let the application do everything so let's see how we address e each of those inefficiencies so we talked about the interrupts so first three interrupts context switches and synchronization they are primarily addressed because uh, we introduced uh, something called event based busy polling and we use a socket priority and along with that the symmetric queue that essentially creates isolation between the application thread of execution uh, to the hardware queues. And by providing those dedicated express lane, uh, we are able to avoid synchronization, means we are able to get to the lockless free single producer consumer model and everything is uh, driving through the event based, event -based busy polling. So that reduces the interrupt substantially, and this one eventually helps to reduce the context switches. So first three is primarily addressed because of two things, event-based busy polling uh, and um, symmetric queuing, which is providing that, uh, which is creating that isolation between the application thread of execution and the device queues. The next two, uh, which is about uh, how do we improve the working set locality? Uh, because the inefficiencies, we saw the problem about when, when you have the kernel-based protocol implementation, it is a challenging where your application and the protocol processing was not really happening in the same context. So here again, with the event-based busy polling, uh, basically we let the application decide when, when to trigger the busy polling. And now, since the busy polling is happening in the context of the application, the protocol processing is naturally happening in the context of the application. Uh, 
And we could do this because now we have this uh, dedicated queues uh, uh, per application so that we can put the owners back onto the application that how they want to drain the queue and when they want to drain the queue. And as part of draining the queue, the protocol processing will naturally happen in the context of the application. And as a result of that, your working set locality issue is also addressed. Uh, we, this one we couldn't do earlier in that uh, when you typically have the shared queue model where essentially the kernel proxies, the uh, basically the uh, processing of the packets, uh, yeah, basically the protocol processing, which is handled by the kernel in case of the shared queue concept. But this is the important property you get uh, or one get with the AD queue where you have isolated queues and uh, where the application is essentially driving the protocol processing. But more important to that one, now, since it is happening in the application context, the application context behavior is truly reflected in the wire behavior, which otherwise doesn't happen. If you are going through the kernel base, uh, basically where, where the kernel is proxying the protocol processing for you on your behalf. So this is a most important property. And this, this look goes back to that internet stability, that one loop to two loop, right? Where we want the application behavior to be reflected on the wire. And the third, as a, as a result of that, uh, we also reduce the data moment, uh, which because of the single producer consumer model, uh, it's all happening in the context of the application and there is no data moment uh, happen during the packet processing. So working set locality issue is also addressed as part of the ADQ. Uh, now we saw those uh, uh, performance number and how we address the system inefficiencies, but what is next really? So obviously there is a, a lot has been done and there's a lot more to be done, but at high level uh, today we can, uh, we use this uh, TC based approach to uh, basically configure the application and accelerate. That, that has a limit. It is a limit of 16 as it stands now. So with that approach, we could essentially accelerate only 15 ADQ applications. So that is one of the limiting factor. The Second one is uh, it, it has a limited number of con limited configurability, such as we can do bandwidth limit configuration and whatnot per application. Here we refer application means per queue set, means per TC. But we, uh, we, we want to do more and more such configurability. One just example is the, uh, the interrupt setting. Today we have a mechanism from the it tool where you can configure for a given network device, but it is still not per TC. So if you want to provide such an such more configurability option, we have to look uh, how it can be either extended or do we need a different tool or whatnot. And the third one is uh, basically today we have single interface where to configure both TX and RX queues. Uh, TC natively, the, basically TC doesn't support RX queue configuration. So uh, do we need to look at it. Do we need to have a uh, uh, um, basically yet another interface, something like TC, but uh, not be limited by the 16 and provides more configurability. Uh, that's really the next step. And I'm sure uh, as we go along, we will have more and more use cases, which we can try to leverage ADQ and optimize it uh, as we go along. Most, uh, so to prepare this presentation, we use a lo lot of the material and here are the references listed out. Uh, there is a documentation in the, uh, about the XPS using receive queues and whatnot. Uh, likewise, there is a similar or likewise presentation was done last year at the storage developer conference. And there is a ADQ configuration guide and demo uh, kit available at that link. Uh, with this one, I will open it up for the question and answer. Thank you. Okay, hey, Jamal. Jamal, you're you. Oh yeah, sorry, 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 sorry. I said, I, I, okay, I thank the speakers and <laughs> I, I said we are already behind schedule. It's, uh, we're already five minutes past Q and A. Uh, so I'm, I'm gonna take advantage of being the host to ask the first question, okay? Uh, it seems to me 
and I, it, this hasn't changed since last I looked at, um, at um, ADQ, that it requires application changes, right? It, it, is that, well, uh, why not take advantage of things like ARFS and things of that nature? People don't like to go and change their applications. I mean, you'll, you'll, you'll find some niche users maybe that will be more than happy to start using your uh, get sock opts or set sock opts. But in general, uh, if I could just run memcached without making any changes, that would be great. Yes, that's response. true. So the, yeah, uh, uh, that's right. What you said is true, but that application change is only, uh, Basically, it's only needed if you want the best and optimal performance. You can still use the ARFS uh, with ADQ uh, and run the unmodified memcache. You will still get the benefits of, you know, what the ADQ filtering, the busy polling, and symmetric queues. So the performance mileage will vary. It, you may not get the best performance, uh, and yet you can still use the ARFS if you wish to. Did, did you have and any numbers on? Uh, not in this slide set, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but we do have internal comparison done. Say, if you don't run the unmodified memcache as it is, right, and you use all the other ingredients of the ADQ, which we talked about, you still get the benefits. You still get the benefits, and they're like more of like a 10 to 15 percent, you know, that's a, a delta we observe. Moral, but uh, to get the best performance, where you have the single producer and consumer, and then use the busy polling, uh, that's where you try to see the tail latencies are not off the chart. Your P99, P999, and that's where it it really shows up. So the predictability is much better if you make that small change. But and the, again, it's for memcache. But there are certain class of application where you don't need to make any change. Like uh, Nginx, if you use the standard in-kernel load balancer technique of distributing connections to thread, uh, you, you don't modify an application. OK, maybe, maybe I'll defer this to later on. If you can show up at uh, happy hour, maybe show some numbers, or could be uh, could be an interesting topic to discuss. Um, OK, I'll, I'll, I'll squeeze in one more question for me. Uh, or, or, or a comment. On your last, the next steps there for the TCQs, it sounds like yeah. DevLink that was given out yesterday is a, maybe a good solution for that? Uh, maybe we had to look at it more carefully, uh, how we uh, can do the configuration. Okay. That. And, and now I'm gonna to start to read questions from uh, the chat here. So the first one was for Mar Marcello. Uh, is it, it, considering the TC example you gave, uh, can you easily add and remove queues on demand? For example, when a container starts or dies? No, uh, so TC in general is like kind of the one-time shot. It, uh, it doesn't allow dynamically adding or changing the queue layout. If you are changing it, you are essentially reconfiguring the whole network device. Okay, so this is basically that uh, thing that you, you said next steps, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. so, so and I, and I figured that maybe DevLink could, could be a candidate there. Next okay. question is from Boris. What happens to traffic that's already directed to these queues? Does it require closing and opening of all the channels and queues to remap traffic? So I think it's probably the along the similar line, the question, once you have the ADQ configured and if there is active traffic going on and you want to change something, then yes, in that case, uh, the expectation will be kind of uh, close the application, uh, reconfigure your device and kind of uh, reinitiate. Okay, so, so there's a disconnect between the app. You can close the app, but the packets will still be queued on these queues, right? Uh, yes. Uh, you, you, have to, you have to reconfigure. You have to reconfigure, it's, yeah. Okay. I don't know if that answered uh, Boris's question, but um, we don't have much time. We can discuss this during happy hour. Um, am I skipping? I'm just going to look for some someone who followed the protocol who started with a Q, Q, Q. Okay, here, Maxim. Uh, as far as I understand, the ADQ solution you, in the ADQ solution you tie the RxQ processing to the application call by doing busy pod and manual configuration of Q groups with TCMQ prior and steering with TC Flower as needed. What are the advantages of such a prod compared to, I guess this is almost my question, compared to ARFS, which also ensures that RxQ processing and application processing run on the same CPU core and doesn't require manual configuration. Is yeah, follow up, is, is ADQ fully upstream? ADQ is uh, all the kernel bits are upstream. The 
we don't plan to any any change anything else the driver bits are coming there in the pipeline but to answer to that question that arfs is it's solving the problem uh, it doesn't solve the problem about the first level of filter for the given application. ADQ is trying to solve that. It provides a, uh, the first level of isolation in the hardware for a given application. Okay, uh, maybe I'll, I'll, I'm sorry for everybody who's been asking a lot of questions here. Okay, Shrijit, you get an opportunity. Did I miss how well, RxQ, okay, you wanna, you wanna talk? Yeah, yeah so I'll, I can <laughs> summarize and I think we are running out of time, right? So. Uh, right. Firstly, I'm, I'm a little confused because flow, if you're trying to solve the net channel design, you have to have per application control, which basically means either you're doing flow director or something else. RSS is not a sufficient answer. At that point, you are fundamentally in the same spot as ARFS and flow director. And ARFS, last I checked, ICE and I40E does not have an upstream ARFS support. So I, unless you guys uh -huh. are doing... Yeah, so uh, it's implemented, it's in the pipeline. So it's- Okay, so you guys have an are, early yeah. data point and it would be Correct. very interesting to see why this is in any way different because if you're in the kernel and you're not running a user space stack like what NetChannels was doing, I, I'm actually having difficulty understanding mechanically, what did you skip? Because you're gonna go through the same process interrupt, send signal, give TCP completion, give socket wake up, loop, all you're going to do is separate into queues, which is what ARFS is already capable of doing. So I'm, I'm missing something very fundamental. Yeah. So there are additional driver level optimization, Srijit, which will come as the driver gets more and more upstream. And they are one of the catalysts for improving the performance. And we are always on the lookout okay. of doing more and more optimization. 